The Under the Knife case study is a great way to um, check your knowledge of, um, of action potentials. Um, and so poor Kevin has appendicitis and he's in the operating room and he's going to go under anesthesia. Um, and we want to answer some of those questions about what anesthesia does. So the first question is looking at sodium movement at resting membrane potential. And so we know that there's a lot of sodium outside of the cell um, at resting membrane potential. And so that gives the outside of the cell a, a, pos a positive charge. And the inside of the cell has a negative charge because of all the proteins and negative ions in there. So when we're thinking about ion movement, we have to look at two things. We have to look at charge, um, so whether it's positively or negatively charged, and we have to look at um, the concentration of the ion itself, so how much sodium is on the inside and outside of the cell. At rest, sodium is going to move on what's called the electrochemical gradient. So it's going to move from a positive charge to a negative charge, so from outside the cell to inside the cell. Um, and then it's also going to move from a high concentration of sodium to a low concentration, which also happens to be from outside to inside the cell. So there's two things that are pulling sodium into the cell, that um, the electrical charge and the concentration gradient. Um, and I think you're probably thinking, but wait, why isn't there more sodium inside the cell than outside of the cell then? Well, it's our friend, the sodium potassium pump, which just keeps pumping sodium back out into the extracellular space. So sodium's going to be coming in down its electrochemical gradient, but it's going to get pumped out by the sodium potassium pump. Question two asks about um, depolarization, hyperpolarization, and threshold. And before we hit any of these terms, we need to think about what polarization is. And so I know you've been working with it a while, but it's a really hard concept to grasp. Polarization is the difference in charge between the inside and the outside of the cell. If there is no difference in charge, it would not be polarized. But because there's a different in, difference in charge, it's called polarized, okay? So because the outside of the cell is more positive than the inside of the cell, cell we have this voltage difference of around negative 70 or so. Um, so depolarization D means un, right? And so we're removing the polarization. So we're decreasing the difference between the inside and the outside of the cell when we depolarize the cell, right? So that positive charge on the outside and that negative charge on the inside are going to get closer to the same during depolarization. So, um, uh, so we're decreasing the size of that charge difference. Hyperpolarization is going to be the opposite of depolarization. Hyper means bigger, right, or more. And so hyperpolarization is increasing the charge difference between the inside and the outside of the membrane. So we have depolarization decreases the charge difference. Hyperpolarization increases that charge difference. And then we have threshold. So threshold is that magic mark, that negative 55 millivolts that triggers an action potential in a neuron. And so at, a, at rest, a membrane has to be depolarized enough to hit threshold. If the cell membrane is hyperpolarized, it's going to take a lot more input, a lot more of those um, uh, excitatory um, potentials coming in to reach threshold. So now we're down to question three, and it says Kevin is conscious when certain neurons in his brain are active. They depolarize and undergo action potentials. Describe the process of depolarization of a neuron to threshold. And here we're talking about those EPSPs, right? Those um, excitatory postsynaptic potentials. And so here, um, each time we have an EPSP, or um, they're going to kind of uh, collect together and depolarize 
that cell body. Eventually, that signal is going to be sent across the cell body and hit the axon hillock. And the axon hillock, when that area uh, gets depolarized to threshold, that's when it triggers an action potential. And those voltage-gated sodium channels that are by the axon hillock are going to open up and we're going to get sodium rushing inside the cell. Okay, so um, we need some, and we need more EPSPs than IPSPs, right? So more excitatory postsynaptic potentials than inhibitory postsynaptic potentials to reach threshold, right? And once we have enough, once we hit that point, um, those voltage gated channels by the axon hillock are going to open on up. So when in question four it asks, um, what does Cole mean when he says that anesthesia inhibits neurons? It's really just preventing neurons from reaching threshold. No threshold, no action potential. In question five, we're looking at the difference between um, leakage and voltage-gated potassium channels. So when we think about leakage channels, leakage channels are found all over the cell, whether we're talking about potassium or sodium channels. And those leakage channels are um, are about um, resting membrane potential, okay? So at least some leakage channels are always leaking some potassium, or if it's a sodium channel, it's leaking some sodium. Um, so the leakage channels are always at least allowing some potassium out. But then those voltage-gated potassium channels are the channels that open <clears throat> based on voltage. And so they open in response to reaching threshold. But remember, potassium channels are slower than the sodium channels, so they open later than the sodium channels. So we get to question six now. And so question six just asks, what happens if we add more potassium leak channels? Um, and so if we add more potassium leak channels, that potassium is going to move down its concentration gradient, right? So it's gonna go from inside the cell to outside the cell. Um, and when it does that, it's going to um, cause a really high concentration of potassium outside of the cell. Um, So now we have the cell hyperpolarized, right? So it's further away from threshold, therefore less chance of an action potential. Which takes us to question seven, which is asking about what happens when a patient has hyperkalemia? Hyperkalemia is a high level of potassium ions found outside the cells, right? And so if you have a really high amount of potassium outside the cell, there's going to be less pull on that potassium to move outside um, because the concentration gradient isn't as extreme, right? So that's actually going to move you closer to threshold, okay? So if you have less potassium leaving the cell, it's going to move you closer to threshold because and, and that's making those neurons more likely to have an action potential. And so for our last question, it asks about the effect of um, potassium on skeletal muscle. And so um, if we look at this from an evolutionary perspective, neurons and muscle cells are very, very closely related, but muscle cells are like neurons that can shorten. Okay, so um, they have very similar um, channels on the membrane, action potentials, all these fun things. Um, so when you have um, the general anesthesia, the effect on muscle cells is that it's going to limit the ability of a muscle cell to have an action potential which triggers contraction. Okay, and that's generally a good thing, right? If we're being operated on, um, we don't want to be moving around, right? Squirming under a knife is not a good idea. But at the same time, it can um, hinder an action potential in muscle cells 
while the person um, starts to come out from anesthesia. So they are unable to indicate that that they're coming back, um, going back to consciousness, uh, yet perhaps still being operated on. Um, so lots of fun things to to think about. I hope that this helps um, you kind of kind of get a better grasp of these action potentials.